family has learned from growing this company over the years and sticking true to their values. So please welcome Lisa Bronner. Thank you, Robin. I'm really glad to be back. It was a lot of fun last year and a lot of fun to meet uh, other folks that are starting businesses in this industry with great ideas, a lot of passion, a lot of vision, and if I can help make that uh, process any easier, that will be very satisfying. So we were a young company once. We were one man with an idea at one point, and uh, when my grandfather, Dr. Bronner, passed away in 1997, our company was valued at $3 million, which was a tremendous amount for one person to have accomplished. And as I will share, it was almost not entirely his intent. But since that time, my brother, David Bronner, has been running the company along with my mom, my other brother, and my husband. And the company last year uh, was valued at $95 million. And so in the 20 years, not quite 20, well, uh, 19 years since my grandfather passed away, that uh, we have had tremendous growth, but it has not been without its lessons, and some of them very hard. So, but before I begin, I, I want to give a shout out to the other side of my family, because here with me today is my uncle Joe Craning, and two of my cousins, Heather Dinger and Jill Longo, and... <laughs> My Uncle Joe gave me my first job when I was 10 years old in his excellent uh, moving and storage company, Andy's Transfer in Glendale, that is currently owned by my cousin Jill and her husband Pat. And in that office, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about family businesses. I learned a lot about how offices run and just the professional world in general. So I thank you, Uncle Joe, for that start. So Dr. Bronner's is a fighting soap company. We've always clung to that description because ever since the beginning of my grandfather's founding it, we have um, been part product and part idealism. And you've never been able to separate those two. My grandfather was very passionate about issues of his day, many of which have not gone away. His particular passions were about fluoridation, fluoridating the water supply, and that was back in the 40s before anything was really known about it, and my grandfather did not have much of an audience. He understood the issues, and he understood the environmental impact and the impact on human health, but uh, didn't have many people who were listening to him. He was also tremendously passionate about world peace. And that is because my grandfather came from a background of tremendous tragedy brought about by the unrest and the, and the Holocaust. My grandfather's family was a German-Jewish soap-making family. They owned three soap factories in southern Germany. The center picture over there is one of the factories taken in the 1800s. And uh, the factories were confiscated and Aryanized in the uh, lead up to World War II. He and his sisters fled the country, but his parents did not, and they all perished in the Holocaust. And so coming from that background, my grandfather, instead of letting that um, drive him towards bitterness or hatred, it inspired him to have a passionate call for world peace. And so he wrote a philosophy that he called the moral ABC, that we are all brothers and sisters united under one, uh, one God, and regardless of your racial background, your ethnic background, your religious background, that we are all brothers and sisters. And so this is what he called the moral ABC. And he used to speak on this topic in, uh, in Pershing Square here in Los Angeles, and when people would come to speak, he would give them a bottle of soap. When he realized people were coming and taking the soap and not listening to him speak, he then <laughs> wrote his philosophy on the label so that when they took the soap, they'd take the philosophy with him. <laughs> so that is why we have this bottle of soap that is covered with tiny writing, and it's all his thoughts. We'll never take it off. Um, However, every one of our labels has a different section of his writings, so you would have to get them all and read them all to get the whole story. We've also put together a book, and the furthest poster over there is, a, is an image of it. We compiled his writings into a book called The Moral ABC, and it even has some extras. So if you have always wanted to get the full picture of uh, what he was saying, you could, you could read that. I have some with me, actually. So in growing a company from 
3 million to 95 million. And honestly, last year's talk was how my grandfather got it to that point, the, more about the obstacles he overcame. So if that's still available, you can go check it out. I don't know if that's still online. But um, I'm going to talk about the past 18 years. <coughs> So my grandfather passed away in 97 from Parkinson's. My dad had taken over the company, but he passed away in 1998 from lung cancer. And so at the age of 24, my brother David took over Dr. Bronner's. He did not have a background in business, uh, and not specifically in soap making, other than what he had picked up, being the grandson of a soap maker and the son of a chemist. His degree was in biology. Nonetheless, here was a soap company that needed running, and we had decided that it was worth going forward even though uh, we didn't have the background or the training. Somehow, by hook and crook, a lot of mistakes and a lot of learning, we've managed to push forward. As I've been thinking about the lessons that have been most pivotal to us, I've realized that a lot of the lessons come down to the admission that we make a lot of mistakes that things go wrong, that we have weaknesses, that despite our best efforts and our best uh, preparations, things don't go as planned. But a lot of our learning has come from those very problems, come from those times of turning those mistakes and pushing through them, learning from them, and turning them into successes. Now, when I was given this topic, um, my, my hesitation was that I am not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the company. I do things like this, which is what I consider the fun part for me. I get to go out and meet great people and give talks and go to new places. I write. Uh, but I feel like I'm not as much a part of the day-to-day -day growing of the company. And so I talk to each of my uh, family members who are and let them each give me one lesson. And um, so you're hearing from them as I talk. So let me introduce you to them. So the company, just to put it in perspective, grew from one person, my grandfather, there in that closest picture to me, to this is our picture that was taken in December of 2015. So I know you cannot see individual faces from here, from where you're sitting, but you can see that there are a lot of people in this picture. There's 150, and when you look at it closely, you'll see that there are a few extra. Um, <laughs> It's amazing what you can do with photoshopping. And so if you've ever read any of our label, you'll notice that my grandfather, what's that? Oh, I don't know. Can you guys hear me in the back? Are we good? Okay, I'm good, I'm good. Oh, that's okay. Um, so uh, yeah, my grandfather cites a lot of people who inspired him. And if you try to like categorize the people who inspired him, you'll have a tough time because there are people of a wide range of religious backgrounds, scientific backgrounds, athletes, politicians, uh, authors on the label. And basically, you can sum it up by saying my grandfather drew from anybody who pursued excellence in any capacity, whether it was physical excellence through athletics, through statesmanship, through science, or through spiritual writings. You'll find some of those people in this picture as well. I use it as a great lesson for my children on the power of Photoshop and not to believe pictures. <laughs> but it's a great picture. So we have grown a lot. So in, the, in this picture, right here is my, my brother Mike, who is our president. And over here with the headband, you can see my brother David. He is our CEO. And he would only agree to that title as long as we insisted that it stood for Cosmic Engagement Officer. <laughs> And then my mom right here, who, she's not even a brawner by birth, but she has been, I would say, the, the, the element of continuity through the generations. And she is our chief financial officer. My brothers like to stay, say they, she still pays their allowance. <laughs> and then my husband, Michael, who uh, also married into this crazy family and is our chief of operations. And so I let each one of them give me give me their input on something that they've learned. So my brother David was asked for a, a Korean uh, newspaper just a couple weeks ago how we have managed to keep a family business running through the years without fighting. And he said, well, we haven't. <laughs> we have had a lot of trouble. We have had a lot of fighting. 
But through those times, we have realized the value of diverse opinions, the value of diverse ways of thinking, and different ways of approaching situations. Uh, and we have had this underlying core um, that this company is something worth doing, the vision of the company is something worth keeping, and that our family as a unit is worth uh, keeping together. And so we didn't, none of us intended on being soap makers. My oldest brother David, as I said, has a degree in biology. My brother Mike has a degree in English, as do I. And my husband has a degree in missions and ancient Greek. And so <laughs> if you think you're getting into a business and, oh, my, my background's not in this, I don't think I can do it, you can because it's a willingness to learn new things, to take on new challenges. And if there's anything I learned in college that I still apply today, it may not be how to write an essay or diagram a sentence, but it is that I learned how to learn. And if that's where you are, then you're in the right place. The very first step, lesson, that we, that we can identify in growing our company is that you have to have a quality product or quality service that you're offering to people. If you don't have that, then there is no business. As idealistic as you may be of what you want to accomplish socially, in activism, in the government, in industry, whatever it is, if, if you don't have a quality product or service, you don't have a foundation. And so we sum this up for ourselves in the phrase, we need to do well so we can do good. We need to do well with our product. So although a lot of people come to us and say, we want to be part of what you're doing, you know, the GMO labeling campaigns, the um, animal welfare campaigns, the legalization campaigns, all these things that are great, those are great. And we are very glad that they are part of what we do as a company. But if this soap is not good, then we have nothing. So we are a business and if you walk in our door, it will feel like a business. And so we make sure that our ingredients are the best they can be, that they are high quality, our formulations are, are solid, um, they don't change. Uh, we test uh, batches repeatedly to make sure that there's nothing wrong with them because our foundation is our soap. So you have to look at the basics of any business there. The second uh, lesson I got from my brother Mike, who is our, our vice president, our president, I'm sorry, president of, uh, and, and he focuses mostly in international sales as far as his day-to-day -day, day -day work. But he said, he got this from my dad, from my grandfather, is that you have to invest in your employees. Because without them, you are nothing. That regardless of who's on top, without the people who are making things happen all along the way, your company falls apart. Who would we be without our employees? Who would we be without the farmers who are growing the coconuts, who make the oil that goes into our soap? Who would we be without our, our soap maker out on the production floor who puts it together? Who would we be without the people who bottle our soap who label it properly, who put the caps on, who would we be without our sales force, without, um, without our bookkeeper. All of these people, every one of them is integral to our success as a company. And I know that some of those jobs, you know, don't sound all that lofty or interesting, but they're all key. And so we invest in our employees. My dad once asked my brother, he had a year to train him between his diagnosis of lung cancer and when he passed away. And so he asked my brother during that very fast year, what is the most important thing about our company? And David said, maybe it's our customers, or maybe it's the soap, or the vision of our founder. My dad said, no, it's the employees, because without them we're nothing. My grandfather had a theory that he called constructive capitalism. And it's the idea that you share the profits of the company with the workers that created it. And so to that end, we compensate our employees very fairly. We have a salary cap of one to five, which means that the highest paid person in the company cannot make more than five times that of the lowest paid person in the company. We give uh, them 15% of their salary contributed to a profit sharing plan and up to 25% of their annual salary as a bonus. 
We also have 100% no deductible health care. We value their health tremendously with annual health fairs, with biometric screenings for their personal benefit, nothing that's reported to us, with on-site yoga classes, on-site massage to keep their health going, because if their health fails, then that impacts our company too. For mor morale, which is just as important as their health and as their financial well-being is their morale. And so we have a lot of time at our company that's devoted to fun and letting loose. If you've ever seen, um, if you've been to a local mud run or uh, parade around here, you might have seen our uh, fire truck, our magic foam experience, which is a crew that is fully employed by us. I think people think that they're just there for the fun, but no, they're an important part of our staff and they um, put together these awesome foam events made with our soap. Uh, but we do that at the plant too. We have mariachi bands, soccer teams, we give surfing lessons, uh, impromptu tea parties, and a really killer Christmas party. So morale around our company is very high because we value the, uh, the health and well-being of our, of our employees. This protects us from also from loss of productivity and loss of um, resources from employee turnover because our employees stay. We have a very low employee turnover and so we don't have to spend the time training new people, uh, finding new people, and um, not having them working as well because they're unhappy in their job. As part of this also, last year we uh, got ourselves certified as a benefit corporation because we want to make sure that this way of doing business is protected for years to come. That if we ever have need to bring in outside shareholders, that this way of doing business is not taken from us and our company, our employees are still have the opportunity to be compensated well and treated and treated well. On that note, we have no plans of selling out. <laughs> So if you want to know more about the Benefit Corporation, there's a great article and something I'm going to give you at the end, which is our CSR report, our Corporate Social Responsibility Report, uh, to talk about what exactly we did with to become a Benefit Corporation and why we did it. But I'm going to give that to you at the end. I have it in this box over here, because if I give it to you now, you'll read it, because it's far more interesting than I am. <laughs> The third lesson that uh, came from my husband, as I said, chief of operations. So he's really involved in the nuts and bolts. He lives in numbers. He speaks in, in spreadsheets. And uh, I have to stop him sometimes when we're having a conversation. And he'll say, well, let me show you, how it, let me show you in a spreadsheet. I'm like, just tell me. Um, and he said, you have to tend to your supply chain. Because we have a good soap, but it can go awry quickly if our supply chain gets messed up. We're very careful about our supply chain. Merging your supply chain with your ideology is something that takes a lot of business sense and practice. Because where you're getting your supplies is just as important as what they are. Now we have looked at our supply chain very carefully in the past years. About uh, 10 years ago, no, 13 years ago, we, we took our supply chain organic as much as we could. We start with our major ingredients because we feel we can have the most impact if we as a company are putting the demand out there for organic coconut oil, organic palm oil, organic olive oil as our three major ingredients. We also have organic hemp oil and organic jojoba oil. We just kind of go down the list based on the volume that we use. I'll get to palm oil in a minute because I know that probably raised some eyebrows. We started with the organic because we know that if we're demanding these organic ingredients, then they're going to be grown and the environment is going to be impacted positively. However, we learned that wasn't enough because there's not just an environmental factor in your supply chain. There's also a labor factor. And organic is great. No GMOs, no synthetic or fewer synthetic f fertilizers, pesticides, that sort of thing. No irradiation. But it is silent on the issue of labor. And so when, when we had the organic going well, we thought, you know, we need to go further. This isn't enough. Because you can have something that is organic, that is still grown by people who are paid pittance, who are working in slums. And this wasn't okay for us. 
And so we went fair trade with our major ingredient so far. We're still working on this because there isn't a fair trade source of ingredients for us. We used so much of the world's organic coconut oil that there was no volume available for us. So we founded our own company in Sri Lanka. In the aftermath of the tsunami there, we realized that there was this untapped resource of, um, of coconuts in Sri Lanka. And we founded our own fair trade operation to make sure that our supply matched our ideology. And the people are getting paid well. They have steady guaranteed work. They're working in a place that is safe, that has fair hiring practices, where people are treated without prejudice. Similarly was the issue of palm oil. Now, palm oil has gotten a lot of media attention lately because a lot of the production of palm oil is coming from Indonesia and the Philippines and involves destruction of the rainforest and habitat loss for orangutans. That wasn't okay with us either. And so we looked for a source of palm oil that would avoid those issues, and we set up our own palm oil company in Ghana. And Ghana does not have rainforest nor orangutans, it, but it does, have, um, it does have a supply of palms. And so we set up an operation there that has been running now for uh, five or six years and is doing really well. In fact, part of fair trade is, have, is putting money into a community benefit fund. So not only are the workers benefiting from what we're doing, but the community around them is benefiting as well. And so our community benefit fund in Ghana was able to build a maternity ward onto the local hospital that will benefit anybody in that, in that town, not just our workers. And so, tending to your supply chain, part of it is matching your ideology to your supply chain. But part of tending to your supply chain is making sure your supply chain works. And this is a matter of math. This is, as I said, my husband's call. If you uh, read the news last year, since you're all from the LA area, you might have noticed there was an issue with our port. The, there was a port strike, and it wasn't a full closure, it was a slowdown which was functionally the same thing. As I've said, our coconut oil comes from Sri Lanka, comes across the ocean on ships. So the port slowdown affected us tremendously. Because this had happened before, not a strike, but a problem in supply, we had learned from the prior time to diversify our supply chain. We used to get our coconut oil from just two sources, and they were both having issues delivering on time. So we did expand to five sources. So although the primary amount of our coconut oil does come from our own operation in Sri Lanka, we did learn not only do we need to have more sources, but we also need to have an on-hand supply. And although there is some advice out there that tells you that for inventory, you should just have a just-in-time amount because ex an inventory is expensive to have, it's also really expensive if you don't have your inventory when you need it and you have to start doing things like overnighting supplies, running second shifts, shorting your customers and losing their trust in your reliability. Those are expensive too. So my uh, husband had figured out, he, he said it all came down to the math in surviving that, uh, in surviving that crisis of the port closure of using the coconut oil, we had very carefully um, making the batches that we uh, most needed and it, it was a very slow, laborious thing. We had to reduce the amount of made stock we had because we couldn't build up our supply because perhaps a, an order would come in uh, for a stock we, we didn't have. So the issue there is that we have to, um, you have to do the nuts and bolts even if it seems boring, uh, and if you're not good at it, I'm gonna get to that point as well. So coming from that, a mistake is only a failure if you don't learn from it. This one came from my brother Mike. There have been some mistakes that we've made. A lot of our mistakes have been a lack of communication, communication with our customers. I don't know, I would imagine that other companies don't have um, perhaps the same volume of customer input as we have. We have the most communicative customers I have ever heard of. Um, <laughs> in fact, the way I first started getting involved in the company, I was a stay-at-home mom after I had taught English and then I became a stay-at-home mom. And my brother said, you know, I'm trying to you know, work on, David's working on 
a lot of activism and, and company management. Mike's working on uh, international sales and we are getting all these emails and we just don't have the time to answer them and so I started answering emails and eventually got too much for me. We now have three people who answer emails and answer the phones for our customers. So one of the mistakes that we lear learned from was that if we do anything different to our soaps we have to, or not even our soaps, our whole company, we have to communicate. So for example palm oil because there's so much attention on palm oil right now, as there should be, there's a lot of problems with palm oil production. Uh, palm oil as an ingredient is being used all over the place in food and personal care. But our customers see palm oil in our products and it's just a red flag. What are you doing? Are you supp you're supporting, you know, uh, environmental impact, devastation of the rainforest. And so we learned that it is much better to be, to communicate with them through our social media, through uh, even messages on our bottles, uh, through any channels that we have with what, are, what we're doing and why, uh, because our customers keep us accountable. There are going to be problems. There are going to be things that don't go right. We recently had a batch of soap that did not smell right. It smelled fishy. That's not how you want your soap to smell. <laughs> So we learned that we, you know, instead of squelching a problem, we need to face it f f straight on. So we, any, any customer, well, we, we got the batches from the customers that were calling us. Fortunately, all our bottles are labeled with a number. We were able to track the bottle. How did we learn to do that? Because we in the past have had a similar problem with something went wrong with a batch and we didn't have any labeling on the bottles. We had no idea where that batch had, uh, had all shipped out to and it was sort of like walking in the dark. And so from that we learned that we have to label our bottles, there's, there's, a, there's a code uh, lasered on to every bottle so that we could trace that batch. And we learned it's, it's, it's you know, hard, but it was worth doing because we need to protect the integrity of our product. So the other thing was our bar soap. We used to short a lot of bar soap because we would make it just in time. Bar soap has a lot of steps. You have the raw materials going, goes into one production system that makes uh, the base. It comes out as a bunch of bar soap pellets. It goes to another production setup where it's got the scent added, goes to the extruder where it's pressed into the, uh, the bars, chopped up, put in wrappers. There's a lot of steps and we were not managing that efficiently enough and with enough foresight that when one step had a hiccup, it shut the whole thing down. And so we had to learn that our bar soap uh, inventory needed to be higher so that we weren't shorting our customers. Because if we get the reputation of being an unreliable supplier, people are going to look for a supply somewhere else. The last lesson I wanted to share with you came from my mom as CFO. She said, you need to identify and admit your weaknesses and address them. You can't just shove them under the carpet and hope that nobody notices. One of our greatest weaknesses in, in this generation, which is the fifth generation of soap making, was a lack of background. None of us were trained as soap makers. None of us were trained as business people. My mom is the closest we had and she was a middle school math teacher. And so we all were very intelligent, which was helpful, but with no background in business or with accounting. My dad didn't even have a college degree and had on-job training as a chemist. But we acknowledged that and we listened to consultants. We brought in a lot of consultants. We had weekly workshops, uh, you know, just the five of us. Um, and uh, accounting consultants, lawyers, you know, people that you think, oh, I don't really want to listen to them, but you need to listen to them or else someday it's going to come back to bite you. So we brought in these consultants and spent a lot of time in training ourselves because part of those employees that I was talking about taking care of are you because you are no good to your company if you are burnt out and used up. And so you need to spend some time strengthening yourself now that may mean learning to incorporate, you know, some relaxation and such, but it also may mean get, getting some education, maybe not necessarily going back to school. There are so many options for educating yourself right now online through consultants. So we brought in consultants, attorneys, CPAs, business coaches 
to train us to say, look, we don't know. We've got good ideas. We've got a good product. We've got a good company. We're fairly intelligent, but we need, we need help with all the details here. Now, they didn't necessarily blindly take people's advice. They would take it in. They'd discuss it privately, ponder it, sort of work it into the mission of our company and the way we want to do business and move ahead. There were some things that we did that still defied the advice of business consultants, such as when my dad, uh, towards the end of his life, uh, he and my mom donated a 1,200-acre parcel of land in San Diego County to the Boys and Girls Club. Now, that was not the business advice coming from our accountant. Because if you know anything about tax law, you know that when somebody dies, you have 50% of the value of their assets taxed, uh, a tax of 50% um, to pay for the uh, inheritance. And my grandfather had just died in 97 with the company valued at $3 million. So we could have used that 1,200-acre parcel to sell it and pay for the $1.5 million tax that we were still facing. And then my, my dad was nearing the end of his life as well. However, and that was an instance where we let our ideology trump what made the most business sense. We had long intended to donate that property for the benefit of the children of San Diego County, and they went ahead and did it. But in many other areas, we have realized that, look, the boring stuff, the business, the numbers, the laws, that keeps a company going. And so um, my, brother, my husband, rather, we did go back to school and earn an MBA. Uh, we've brought people on board. And my, my husband is the first to acknowledge that he brings people on board that are a whole lot smarter than him. And if that's intimidating to you, then that's a problem. Because you need people that strengthen your weaknesses. And so if you have an area of weakness, you need to find somebody that can fill it for you. Or unless you, or you educate it yourself, educate yourself. The thing is that pride will get you really nowhere. If you're coming out of business from a sense of entitlement of things ought to go this way and it's just not fair, well, that's that's going to be your first stumbling block. Uh, pride will get you nowhere. If you can't see where you need advice, you're going to fall. You have to ask questions, admit mistakes, seek help, be willing to learn, surround yourself with people that can help. Learn everything there is to know about your product, your service, your industry, and then keep learning some more. Learn about the ingredients, learn about the background, the history, learn about the competition, learn everything there is to know, and then learn some more. Now, as I said, today I brought for you our copy of our CSR, our uh, report, our Corporate Social Responsibility Report. This is it. We started doing this last year because, as I said, communication is key. And we want to be the most transparent company that we can. And so we want to communicate everything with our customers that we're doing, both in our ingredients and in our products, as well as our way of doing business. And so we have our mission statement in six ways that this plays out in what we do as a company. And I want you to take this with you and read through it. And then you will also get your own copy of this fabulous picture. <laughs> and you can study it. So <laughs> now, I've just, I've just unfolded this. And um, if you think you might have trouble folding it up, you might want to take a video right now of me doing it, because it can be <laughs> a little bit confusing. So this one will show you all the people. Nobody's labeled, because it's not really all that important. Um, although the Bronners are all up front, uh, for the most part, my children aren't in here, but that's that's good. Um, and then a lot of the uh, animals and people on the label. So any animal you see on here, the snowy owl, the beaver, the tigers, they're all mentioned on the label. So you can find them too. Okay, so to fold this back up, you take the whole thing, fold it in half, you grab it in the middle. Wow. <laughs> all right. Yes. Okay, so I have this for you to take uh, today to read more about who we are. And then, yes. 
just because we like to have a lot of fun, we have our Groovy All One bumper sticker that you can take with you as well. So, are there any questions I can answer about what we're doing at Dr. Bronner's, about who we are as a company, or anything else you heard today? Hey, yes. Um, I use your soap, and I have a question regarding um, like the oils that you. Um, oh, yeah, about the video. Oh, okay. I have a question about the oils that you use in there. So, um, I can use it as a household cleaner and for my skin and whatnot. But for when it for my hair, for the consistency of my hair, it's difficult because it weighs it down a little bit. The oils and. And the thing is, I want to use it because it's so natural, and I'd rather use it than a shampoo with whatever in it. Um, can, can you give some helpful hints on how to utilize that for your hair? Absolutely. The, the issue about our hair is that our hair likes acid. Our hair is very sensitive to pH. Soap is naturally alkaline. It's impossible to make soap that's not alkaline. Now, it's not a strong alkaline. The pH of our soap is 8.9. You might remember that 7 is neutral. So 8.9 is not that high. However, it's too high for our hair. So our hair strands um, have are, are segmented, and those segments kind of for lack of a better word, they kind of have joints. They kind of have sections that are a little bit free. And when they, when they encounter alkaline, they stick out. So it's like your hair suddenly becomes a hard piece of Velcro. And it'll feel sticky. And it will look dull because you've got all these things sticking out on it. Uh, and it will feel like it's not rinsed out fully and that you have residue of the soap on your hair. It's actually the hair itself. And so our soap really only works on hair if you rinse it with an acid. So for example, apple cider vinegar is a great acid to use. A dilution of half apple cider vinegar, half water works well. We also do make a hair rinse that uh, works just as well. Honestly, I go back and forth between our hair rinse and apple cider vinegar. Um, our hair rinse, it's totally different from any nice, pretty pearlescent shampoo and conditioner you might be using. It's dark brown. It has shikakai powder in it. Also has lemon juice, which is giving it the uh, acidity that it needs. And after you rinse the soap out, you dilute a cap full of the, um, of the hair rinse, either in a cup or just water in your hand, and then you run that through your hair. And it, the acid of that causes those strands to smooth out. So you and I do not recommend our soap if you have color treated hair unless it's henna. Uh, traditional colors will leach out. So give that a show. Where do you get that? Where do you get the hair rinse? Yeah. Well, um, it's not as widely known. It's not as widely available as our Castile soaps. So my best option would be online. I mean, we we sell it, but I've actually seen a lot better prices on other retailers' websites. Uh, I believe Sprouts carries a full line of our products, so locally that's that's a great option, and Whole Foods as well. So, yes. Are you considering selling your raw materials since you you offer? You, know, you talked about how uh, environmentally conscious they are. Our coconut oil mill in Sri Lanka does sell to other other companies. So if you are looking for a source of coconut oil, that is available. I'd be happy to get you in contact with them. The palm, the palm oil. I'm not sure if they have excess. Um, you don't happen to know Stacy, do you? I have Stacy with me. She's our social media content manager. I'm looking over at her. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if we have excess palm oil. If you want to grab my business card and email me, I'll find out the answer for you. Um, so we have uh, our olive oil. We don't own that company. There is a fair trade op uh, a, a company. It's a beautiful operation in Israel um, that, draw, that sources olives from both Palestinian and Israeli farmers called Canaan. And so they are our supplier, and we don't own them. Yeah, so good stuff, though. All right. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. an operation, but I started, I got turned on to it because freshman year of college, I, I just aged I just age myself, but freshman year of college, mm -hmm. I um, spent that summer in Hawaii doing archaeology for the state. Wonderful. And they said, you have to buy the soap because we were bathing in streams and, and uh, waterfalls. Fantastic. And that's what we all had to go out and get. That was the first time I'd ever seen soap and that's great. Thank you. Thank you. It's completely biodegradable soap. Good for camping. All-purpose head-to-toe.
that's a great story, yeah. So if you want to know more about just this, the company back then, my grandfather went blind when in uh, the late 60s, and so from uh, the last 30, 40 years of his life, he was he was running it blind. It was really incredible. And he acknowledged his own areas of weakness. One fellow named Salvador who worked with him starting at age 17 and he just retired in December. And my grandfather said to him, I have the ideas and you have the strength, so let's partner. And so Salvador was his, uh, was his eyes and hands during that. So. Yes? How do you come up with the employee engagement activities each year? Do you, are they different each year or is it the same? I, I wouldn't say that there's a set way we do it. If somebody has a good idea and we say, let's go with it. The fire truck, for example, I mean, that's not employee engagement. That's a lot of outreach. But that was just somebody heard that they were selling an old fire truck down in San Diego. And much to my mom's initial horror, David said, let's go buy a fire truck. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so I would just say somebody has a great idea and, uh, you know, gets a bug in someone's and someone's willing to make it happen. Um, you know, the soccer team takes a captain out there and uh, we put on these great lunches mostly because we've got some great cooks in our company and they, you know, that's not why they're hired. They are, you know, employed in some other capacity, but the, this one guy makes these fish tacos that are just fantastic. <laughs> so uh, we celebrate things. When we have, when we have uh, in company successes, such as in March this year, we had our biggest month ever. We shipped 12.2 million in orders, and so we, we celebrated that. We had a great lunch at the end of that month. All right, thank you very much for having me today. Thank you so much, Lisa.